Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Nessery. I am an associate professor of politics at Wake Forest University and a co-editor, along with my colleague Peter Savellas, of uh, and two colleagues who aren't present uh, today, uh, of PS, Political Science and Politics. Uh, this is our panel on democratic backsliding uh, in conjunction with a special issue on democratic backsliding, which will be appearing on First View sometime in the next mm, two months or so, depending on a couple of production uh, small things. Um, uh, before we begin, uh, just tell you a little bit about the format. Uh, it will go, uh, or at least it can go, a bit beyond the normal APSA uh, time limit because there's no one in here after us. I think we'll hold it to two hours, though. Um, we are going to give a, a short presentation by uh, uh, Ann Meng and uh, Andrew Little of their uh, paper, and then we will go into a roundtable discussion with uh, questions that I've shared in advance uh, for all of our other contributors to the special issue, uh, including some who are online, uh, who uh, to be able to answer those questions and talk about uh, the issue of democratic backsliding in general and uh, Ann and Andrew's paper in particular. Uh, there will be Q&A both live and, uh, in the audience and live on Zoom. So if you're in the audience, uh, when the Q&A time sort of uh, is, uh, uh, when we're doing Q&A, uh, come up to right behind the projector. The microphone will project you both in the room and also on Zoom. If you're on Zoom, uh, simply uh, raise your hand using the raise hand button, and then we can enable your audio so that you can speak to the audience and the audience can speak to you. Um, we will, uh, let's go around really quickly, you know, don't give your whole CV, but just, you know, brief introduction of yourself, uh, and then we'll get started. Please go ahead. Andy May, I'm with the University of Virginia. Hi, I'm Andrew Little. I'm, I'm faculty at UC Berkeley. Hi, I'm Stefan Lindberg. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Gothenburg and director of the VDEMI Institute there. I'm Dan Treisman. I'm a professor of political science at UCLA. I'm Yana Garhoska. I'm the research director at Freedom House. I run Freedom in the World. Rob Blair, associate professor at Brown University. Go ahead, Nicholson, political science at the University of Oslo, and one of the BI of Uh Daniel Lasso, I'm at uh, Colorado State University. Okay, uh, so well, let's get started. Go ahead, uh, and I will share your um, slides on the screen here. Uh, here we go. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's so amazing to meet so many people. Um, Andrew and I are really honored that so many people are interested and super engaged with our piece. Um, thank you so much to um, Peter and Justin for putting together this amazing special issue. Thanks so much for the contributors. Um, I'm really, really excited for all of you guys to, to read the special issue. I think we have an amazing discussion and a really, really useful debate, several debates as I'm gonna uh, summarize here. So in general, Andrew and I just wanna stress how grateful we are um, for just like a really, really good, several really, really good discussions that have come out of this. Um, and so we're, we're super excited for the special issue. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do right now is um, I'm just going to very quickly summarize the paper, um, but more importantly, Andrew and I are gonna spend more time um, summarizing some of the key um, points of agreement and points of disagreement that kind of came out in this special um, issue. And I think that these debates are super useful for us to kind of think collectively on how we can kind of move forward and research these things productively so that we can make headway on this super important question. Um, okay, so here goes. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the general narrative that kind of Andrew and I started with as well is that we are in a period of global democratic decline. Next slide. Um, the kind of one thing we wanted to do is we wanted to um, kind of see whether this narrative is true by looking at empirical evidence worldwide. Um, and the kind of one thing we noticed was that a lot of existing studies of backsliding um, rely pretty heavily on expert surveys as a source of data. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, so this is what the existing data looks like, right? So these are kind of three graphs we're pretty um, familiar with. The one on the left here is Beatum. The one in the middle is Freedom House. The one on the right is Polity. 
Um, so the first big takeaway is that um, we, uh, or I guess the first thing to note is we focus less on polity, in part because it ends in 2018, in part because um, there actually is no decline in polity, and in part because they make some kind of weird coding choices like coding the UN for the five. Um, so we'll just kind of put that on the side for now. Um, so, uh, so we're going to focus more on kind of BDM and, and Freedom House, um, which is, I think, where a lot of the discussion is going to be. Um, and the, the one thing I wanted to highlight is um, there have been some existing studies, um, including Dan Treisman's um, really excellent CPS article, um, knowing that the kind of decline in existence scores um, is actually not, um, Dan calls it, is not kind of historically unusual, right? Like even the kind of existing expert surveys don't dip a ton. Um, however, where Andrew and I are coming from is that most of the existing studies are kind of focusing on different interpretations of this existing data. But Andrew and I had um, a couple of concerns about the kind of underlying data itself. Next slide, please. Um, in particular, um, one thing that we wanted to think about was possible measurement issues, right? Um, because expert coded, coded democracy scores rely very heavily on subjective indicators, being in a kind of a mix of objective and subjective. Um, in, in particular, with, when it comes to the study of democracy and the study of backsliding, which have gotten a lot of media attention, it's just like a, it's a very important topic to all of us, right? It's kind of a charged topic. Um, we're concerned that there might be time varying coder bias at play. Right, it could be because of a lot of things. It could be because we now have different standards. We now hold democracies and countries to higher standards, which is not a bad thing, right? But this is something that might have changed over time. It could be that there's more media coverage now. There's kind of a, a whole host of reasons why um, we might be concerned that um, there might be time varying quota bias at play. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that we do is we were like, okay, what if we just tried to kind of take a different angle and look to see if we could take a look at kind of other indicators that were much more objective, right? And so the way we're thinking about objective measures, um, a, a, a kind of a litmus test that we think is useful is just, you know, is it based on kind of observable criteria? And if different people were to code the same case, could they reliably come up with the same answer? Right. Um, and so we basically went on like a data scouting mission. Most of this is just kind of publicly available data that already existed. We drew on sources like NELDA, um, like DPI, stuff like that. So we basically came up with kind of three bins of data, electoral competitiveness, things like turnover, um, executive aggrandizement, things like term limit evasion. And we have um, just a little bit of data on media freedom. Um, we look at the number of journalists jailed and killed, although um, as we know in our piece, um, civil liberties is just extremely hard to measure um, objectively. And this is one place where we really hope future work still a lot more with this. Next slide, please. Um, oh, okay. Um, and um, the kind of big takeaway is that um, basically all of our um, graphs exhibit like a very flat line over the last two decades. The big picture takeaway is that the objective data that we look at show little evidence of global democratic decline over the last decade, kind of contrary to this kind of big narrative we've been seeing. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the graph of turnover, um, which is kind of our favorite measure, right? Um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, this question of are incumbents losing, the concept is of turnover I think we would all agree is a very central component of democracy, right? Whether or not you, you kind of subscribe to the minimalist definition or a broader definition, um, turnover is just a really core concept. Um, furthermore, things that we can't directly measure, which should still be affecting turnover, right? Things like media censorship, um, you know, civil liberties, stuff like that. Basically, staying in power, if it really is the end game, like this should be the outcome to look at, right? So this is kind of, we think, one of the most important outcomes. And as you can see, um, drastic changes with weather incumbents lost following the end of the Cold War, we know about this. But since then, the trends actually don't, you know, change a ton, right? Um, next slide, please. Um, so the other thing that I'm going to show you is, so we basically look at a bunch of different um, objective indicators in our paper. I'm not going to show you a million graphs. Um, so here's just like a summary graph. Um, so we have an aggregate objective index that summarizes all of our data. I want to stress, though, this is, we did not create a democracy score. Please don't use it like a democracy score. 
Um, this is just meant to summarize all of the variables that we looked at. The reason why you shouldn't just throw this into a regression and use it as a democracy score is remember the inputs. The inputs into this are things like, did the incumbent lose or not? A score of one is does not mean that you have perfect democracy and a score of zero does not mean, does not mean you have ultimate autocracy, right? What we looked at is whether the ones and zeros, the pattern changed over time, right? And so that's the reason why this is a summary. This is not a democracy score. Please don't use it like that. In that sense, our goal would be way more um, limiting than, for instance, what we done and freedom house are doing. We wanted to look at data for a to answer a very specific question. Okay, so just wanted to clarify that. So the thick line here is the aggregate summary objective index over time. Once again, there's no dip. Um, the green line is just democracies. The blue line is just autocracies. As you can see, even once you split it up, it, the trends actually still look pretty consistent. The dotted line is just the, the proportion of democracies in every year as defined by voice Miller or Rosada. Next slide, please. Um, okay. So um, I'm now going to kind of move on to um, summarizing some of the kind of big debates, places of agreement and disagreement that came that comes out throughout this special edition, special issue. So first is interestingly, I think there's actually a lot of agreement on like the trend we're trying to explain, right? So what we did here is we normalized all of the different scores, uh, VDAM, polyarchy, and R objective index. Once again, those stressing a little bit of apple and orange here. Um, and we just like, we, we normalized all of them and just put them in the same class. And actually, the trend lines don't look too different, right? There's like kind of minor differences in the, in the kind of last decade. But I think the big picture takeaway is that the differences are actually not that dramatic. However, we do still think that being accurate is super important because measuring democracy is like probably one of the most important questions we think about as political scientists. So we, we do want to take these small differences really seriously, right? But I do think it's helpful for all of us to just like take a step back and just realize that we're generally in agreement about what the trends look like. Uh, next slide, please. So where do the disagreements come from? Um, so um, the one thing we wanted to stress is that Andrew and my, our key empirical claim is that measures of electoral competition have not declined over the last decade. And actually, I don't really think any of the responses challenge this finding. This is one thing that we are actually all in agreement on. The disagreements are kind of, I think, occurring like around the central point. Right, so some of the disagreements emerge when um, we are debating whether to use a more expansive definition of democracy or not. Um, some disagreements occur in terms of measurement, um, you know, relying on expert coded data versus more objective indicators, or whether we should kind of weight by population and stuff like that. Um, so in our original paper, we kind of highlighted two possible explanations that could explain these kind of minor differences, right? So one is it could be that the slight decline in subjective measures um, might be due to changes in the information environment or coding standards, or it could be the case that objective measures might miss important components of backsliding. I think it's important to stress that these possibilities are not mutually exclusive. It could be that there's a bit of truth to kind of both of these possibilities. Um, we also think that these two possibilities are also not mutually exhaustive. It could be that other things are also going on. Um, and so, you know, one of the things Andrew and I hope to achieve in this special issue is, is to kind of clearly delineate these possibilities and also kind of open the door to kind of other possibilities as well. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about before I hand it over to Andrew is, um, in particular, I we kind of um, highlighted three distinct debates that we kept, that we kind of kept seeing appear in all of the responses and commentaries. So I'm going to summarize them here. So the first thing that we don't agree on um, is what is the right sample of countries to look at, right? And so some people argue that maybe we should just look at important countries, right? Like maybe it's like we you know should just focus on like whether the U.S. is backsliding or whether other kind of big and important countries are backsliding. Um, some people argue that, well, we should only focus on democracies, right? Democratic backsliding should just be something that focuses on democratic countries. 
Um, other people argue that no, we should just look at the whole world, right? We should look at democracies and autocracies. Um, so our thoughts on this um, is, so I, I actually think that all of these samples are kind of good to look at and important to study, as long as scholars are clear about what exactly they're studying and, and the kind of particular set of countries they're looking at. However, um, and, and just like as a scholar of autocratic politics, this is just where I'm going to nerd out a little bit. My personal opinion is moving forward, though, I actually think that democracies and autocracies should be studied separately. And here's the reason why. Specifically with autocracies, um, a lot of work has come out recently um, that has kind of basically um, stressed that autocratic regimes kind of fall on the spectrum between institutionalized and personalist autocracies, right? So on one hand, institutionalized autocracies look very democratic. They have kind of quasi-democratic institutions, elections, legislatures, parties, personalist regimes don't. And so when we observe institutionalized autocracies kind of take away some of these democratic appearances and move towards personalism, some would interpret that as kind of autocratization or kind of backsliding in autocracies. However, um, we also have a lot of research, um, including some of my own work, showing that institutionalized autocracies are the most durable form of dictatorship. Right, and so actually moving away from institutionalized autocracies, although it appears less uh, democratic, actually kind of weakens these regimes. So in that sense, institutionalized autocracies are actually the most authoritarian. And so in a sense, moving towards these institutions is kind of moving away from democracies in terms of kind of the, the, the longevity and, and the durability of these regimes, right? And so, I just think that like when it comes to the role and the effect of these institutions in autocracies, they play such a different role compared to democracies. I don't know if it makes sense to study all of these countries in the same kind of line. So that's just kind of my personal opinion about how it might be more fruitful to separate these two. Okay, thanks for indulging my autocratic nerdiness. Uh, next slide. Okay, the second big debate that we have is um, how should we define democracy, right? We probably will never agree on this, and, and maybe that's okay, like as long as there's been political science, I think there have been disagreements on this. Uh, but basically, there's just disagreement over whether a fit or thin definition of democracy should be used, right? So the kind of quasi-minimalist definition that Andrew and I use in the paper focuses on electoral competition, but others prefer kind of a broader definition of democracy that also includes civil liberties and rights protection. Um, so as I said, you know, we probably will never agree, and I think that's generally fine. Um, however, um, our big takeaway is regardless of what is your favorite definition of democracy, we need to understand why measures of electoral competition have not changed, right? So even if you like the broader, more expansive definition, and even if you believe that civil liberty scores have dropped and that there's been backsliding there, why, I really think we need to understand if that really is true, why has this not changed turnover, right? Because turnover, if, if it really is the kind of ultimate end game, what's going on, right? Is it that these attempts don't work or is it that these attempts aren't happening? And I really think that's kind of a crucial place where I really hope future research kind of continues to move in. Next slide, please. Um, okay. And then finally, the third thing we disagree on is how we should measure democracy and measure backsliding. Um, so here, I really don't think there's a silver bullet solution. I think that each approach has its pros and cons. There's just trade-offs with each. Um, so when it comes to objective measures, I think the benefit is that objective measures have the advantage of being replicable and more reliably coded. But I think the drawback here is that objective measures tend to focus on formal institutions, which are more easily observed, right? On the other hand, um, subjective measures have this nice advantage of kind of wide coverage of topics that are difficult to collect data on. However, the drawback here is potential coder bias, especially maybe with kind of hot button topics. Although what I what is really cool in some of the responses for the special issue is that um, various pieces do a lot of kind of robustness checks and address the possibility of, of coder bias. And so I think that's great. I think that's like a great direction that we've moved in. Um, our big takeaway here is um, 
you know, I think that like there has been some discussion of, well, actually, when you kind of look under the hood, even things we think are objective have little bits of subjectivity to it. Um, you know, is is this like delineation really that clear cut? Um, I think that these debates are like good to have, but I do think that I, I don't think we should have like a nihilistic attitude where we're like, well, nothing is objective. That's just like not useful. Let's just like give up, right? I don't think we should give up, right? In fact, you know, our perspective is collecting objective data on all dimensions in democracy might be so hard and so tedious and like so not fun, but it is really important and it's a really valuable goal. And so this is something that we should be kind of moving towards um, instead of, you know, it's fine to debate subjective from the objective, but let's not kind of lose sight of the goal, right? Um, and then, uh, so I think that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Andrew. Um, and now we're going to move into the segment of the talk called Andrew Little Wants You to Say I Don't Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to quickly wrap up with uh, a bit of a hobby part of mine, which I think is really important to this debate, which is the importance of admitting uncertainty to uh, what we're doing academic work. Um, so again, just to say, like, like I started with you know, steeped in this narrative as well. Uh, it wasn't until we, we really started thinking carefully about, about trying to go find some more objective measures of democracy that we started to, to doubt that, that it was sort of obvious that the world was getting less democratic. Um, so why this is important is that, you know, a lot of papers uh, just sort of take as a premise that the world is getting less democratic, and then that's their starting point from which they decide what they're going to study and how they study. Um, and so, you know, I think in a lot of ways, um, political science has become way more careful about, about uh, making claims from data, particularly making causal claims from data. And we think that we should be applying the same level of scrutiny to measure, measurement questions, including uh, as we do the causal questions. And so if we do that, I think we, we realize that there's actually like a lot of open questions. Um, and I think there's like really the proof is in the pudding here that I think by like opening up these questions, we have this fantastic range of responses that I think are really going to move this literature forward. So kind of the first step is we have to admit what we don't know, and then from there we can we can make a lot of scientific progress. And based on what we've read, I'm just really optimistic that we're going to see a ton of great work uh, uh, building on what was a new special issue. Uh, next and last slide. <laughs> um, so there's another reason why admitting uh, uncertainty is important, and that's in sort of the public facing aspect of what we do. So um, we certainly uh, so we did a lot of talking to journalists in the in the course of writing this paper, and they seemed like even more surprised than us that it wasn't obviously true that the world was getting less democratic. They just seemed kind of shocked by that. And so you know, I think uh, I'm sure like everyone that we know on this panel is like a responsible person who's trying to do their best in, in conveying what they think is how the world is working. But there's always going to be a tendency for kind of the most extreme and incendiary claims to be the ones that get the most attention. And so we can potentially get a misleading picture of what the scholarly consensus is if we kind of only draw from those extremes when we see who's going to be who's going to be quoted in all of this. And so I think you know I think a lot of people have a very good concern that that something we can do as scholars is you know raise the alarm about potential threats to democracy in the world. I think that's very important. I think a lot of people are doing great work on that. But if we want people to take us seriously when we when we raise these concerns, they have to trust us. And so if sort of the bits of political science that come out end up being a little bit shakier, we're going to lose this trust and, and lose our ability to potentially raise these important concerns. Um, so let's uh, wrap up by, again, thanking everyone uh, on the panel. We're, we're really excited about all the papers that are coming out. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, the authors will get a chance to give you a little bit about what's going to be in the, in the discussion. So thank you all. Okay, just a moment while I figure out how to uh, go back to where we were. Um, here we go. Okay. And. All right, so uh, like I said before, uh, we had pre-shared uh, some questions with all of our panelists, just so everyone was sort of on the same page could prepare in response. We're gonna start to go through those. Um, we're gonna try to start taking questions uh, from the audience, let's say via 15 or so, um, and that should leave plenty of time, about 45 minutes uh, for a robust discussion. Um, and we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna alternate back and forth asking the questions, and then I would say you can uh, speak as the, as the spirit moves you. If everyone jumps in at once, I, I will uh, jump into referee a little bit. So the first question uh, is, I'm going to read this directly because I, I, I thought a lot about the wording. Uh, would everyone on the panel agree with this statement? 
Pluralistic governance and civil liberties are on average backsliding worldwide, but elections are on average just as effective of, as instruments of majoritarian governance as they were 20 years ago. And if you think, if you agree with that, why? And if you don't agree with that, I assume some people won't, uh, why not? And if everyone agrees, uh, how should this inform our understanding of what's going on with democracies around the world? We're doing like a debate style, like raise, raise your hand if you're uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah stop, go ahead. we're going to go around. Um, yeah, let's, let's actually, that's probably, that's a little more uh, all right, all right. civil. Okay, so yeah. we'll, we'll start with, <laughs> we'll start with this way. That's my stop and stop right here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was put here. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, my answer to that question is no. Um, uh, they are not um, as effective as they used to be uh, 20 years ago. Um, and let me start with saying that, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I just like you and all, and I guess all of us here welcome the, the discussion and the debate. Um, I celebrate uh, uh, pluralism. Pluralism is not only the foundation of democracy, pluralism is also the... Uh, what science is predicated on for moving forward, uh, different perspectives, uh, and and with varieties of democracy, the varieties comes from that. Um, and we also have disagreements and and, and pluralism uh, in in Vida. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think uh, that is 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 very welcome. Um, let me say, I mean. Uh, you also know, most of you at least, that from the VDEM Institute, we produce this democracy report each year, uh, and then the State of the World article that comes out in democratization. Um, that is a product of the Institute. I want to say that it's it's clear it's not a VDEM, all of VDEM behind that. Michael Kopich, Carl Henrik, John, others are not uh, to be held uh, responsible for what we write that report. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I think it's really important that just I mean, without going into details, like we put a lot of weight on population weighted measures of democracy. Uh, by that, uh, the average is back to 1986, of course, because of countries like uh, India and so on. Uh, I think the logic is that democracy is ruled by the people. So it matters how many people are affected. Um, and... Um, for how much democracy we have in the world and how much of backsliding there is. I think it matters more if India with 1.4 billion people slide back on democracy, whereas seashells with 90,000 inhabitants go up, right? It doesn't compensate to me. Um, we also have um, count the number of countries that move up or down you can count, you can set the, treat the uncertainty with different ways. Um, in the democracy report, we counted uh, 42 countries now, sliding back on democracy, a historical record. With, I think Michael's more conservative estimate is, was 32, while most countries, of course, are unchanged. But it's also a lot of countries. Um, I think for elections, answer, on this question, I think... It's really important. I mean, I'm very Robert Dahl, right? Elections are not meaningful without freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of the media. And that's also where we see uh, most of the negative changes, of course. Um, so um, uh, that undermines uh, elections. Um, and I think, you know, we have to be also be, be honest on, you know, why we are here. Uh, this paper that come out and, and question um, uh, democratic backsliding. Um, but, you know, yeah, yeah, on the indicators where you have, uh, where there's data in the paper, you know, um, China comes out as a perfect democracy. Um, Norway has never been perfect. Um, North Korea is fairly uh, good, 0.56 on zero to one. Equatorial Guinea is 0.61. Um, there's no backsliding in Hungary, India, Poland, Turkey, Venezuela. Um, 
There are positive changes in Yemen, Sudan, Equatorial Guinea, Egypt, so on. Um, I, you know, when 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 looking at trends on uh, of the world, uh, I would uh, start to worry uh, if 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 that's enough uh, of basis. Uh, a lot of missingness. Um, Forty three percent of the observations have missingness of um, a quarter of the indicators. Um, and, you know, uh, we show in, the, in our contribution, thanks to a lot of the methodologies, Kyle and Dan Pemstein and others, and Michael's analysis and Carl Hendrick and so on, um, that the missingness is, is associated with um, the cases that we know are backsliding. So it's not at random. Um, so there is bias in this objective in, in, in my world. Um, so, um, it's, it's, it's also important that there are important aspects of the scales and uh, what thresholds we set and so on, like, uh, was mentioned here before. Um, I sufficient to say that I think, um, if you look at that, uh, in that, in the paper, um, I think countries will have to backslide a lot and almost become dictatorial before, uh, these uh, indicators uh, 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 register backsliding. And I wonder if that is objective uh, uh, at all. I think making a bold claim about that there is no backsliding um, uh, or that elections are still effective, as you say, Justin, or question, um, when um, a lot of um, uh, other sources disagree, um, and to make that claim that they, you know, or, or put out there as a speculation, I would say, that it's code of bias. Um, you know, um, I think um, what one thing we know from not only our studies, but mass of case studies uh, that are now out there, um, literally hundreds, I think, um, that a lot of the autocrats or wannabe dictators that undermine democracy, they do it strategically outside of the formal institutions that you can get at with sort of these, re, I would say, reproducible measures. Although I think VDEM, and we make an argument in the paper, is also reproducible. Um, objective is something else. Um, they The autocrats avoid attacking those things. Or if they do it, they do it very late when uh, really turning countries uh, for the worse. And that includes, I mean, we've noticed also from earlier work, uh, Steve Levinsky, I saw you around, um, democracy dies and, and, and now we have lots. All other aspects of elections, including the freedom of association around it and freedom of media are declining in those countries. But also things like, EMB autonomy, you know, uh, other forms of irregular irregularities and so on. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and and coder bias, and I, I don't know, maybe Paul Hendrick will say more about that. We haven't coordinated in detail. Um, but I note that, that that claim that is out there is purely speculative with no empirical analysis. And now... Uh, there was a recent piece by Niels Weidman, I saw you coming into the room in CPS over there, that really makes a rigorous attempt at assessing the extent to which there is uh, this kind of bias and cannot find much evidence at all. But VDEM puts out the coded level data and for different versions of the data. So it's possible to estimate. And our excellent team, um, I should not claim any credit for any of that, Part uh, and Kyle and others um, did a lot of in in our contribution to the special issue, and then there's a longer working paper series, uh, paper with VDEM working paper series version with more detail, uh, and try and draw out the empirical implications if there was bias and assess that with the coda level data um, in all kinds of ways, and and find very little uh, empirical evidence of it. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's when you make claims, uh, 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 you should, it should be evaluated. 
Um, so, you know, and I think it's also finally worth noting that, you know, it's really important to have this debate um, and different contributions and different analysis uh, of it. Um, but also note that what we do actually is noticed out there. I recently seen reports by government controlled press in India, where they refer to this paper and say, oh yeah, now there are all these subjective, they reiterate to using that, I wouldn't call VDEM subjective, um, evaluative perhaps, but oh, they mean nothing because now there's new scientific study showing that um, objectively speaking, there is no uh, backsliding in, our, in India. Um, and uh, I wait to see the same from Erdogan and, and Orban and, and go down the line. Um, so, so what we do uh, is noticed and, and have consequences. Um, thank you. <laughs> I, I hate to be, I hate to be dad. But if we're gonna get through, uh, can try to limit the your your talk to let's say seven to eight minutes. <laughs> I'll, I'll be quite brief. Um, so to repeat the question that, that Andrew posed, uh, so Andrew said pluralistic governance and civil liberties are on average backsliding worldwide, but elections are on average just as effective as instruments of majoritarian governance as they were 20 years ago. Would we agree with that? And uh, so my answer is also no. Uh, on the second part about elections, uh, I do find Andrew and Anne's and Annie's uh, results quite convincing. Uh, they don't measure all aspects of elections. There are, as I, I agree with Stefan, that uh, there are some aspects of elections uh, that are not directly captured by uh, the objective measures that Andrew and Annie look at. But uh, I do believe, based on their evidence, that elections continue to produce turnover, that uh, incumbents are not able, or at least so far, they are not uh, simply refusing to leave office at higher rates than in the past. Uh, opposition parties are still allowed to run about as often as in the past. Uh, incumbents are getting defeated. Uh, leaders are not abolishing term limits more often than before. I think those are really interesting uh, and important facts that uh, we're very, uh, lucky to have had documented. Um, and I think that's significant. So yes, elections do seem to be providing turnover. That doesn't mean that everything about the elections that we observe uh, is wonderful. Of course, uh, there are enormous problems with elections all over the world, as there have been uh, for as long as elections have been taking place. So I do agree with that part uh, on balance, but on the first part about civil liberties, pluralistic governance, my view is that we just don't know. And in fact, the formulation of the question, I, I don't mean to pick on Andrew. No, you should pick on me. I'm the one who wrote it. <laughs> oh, well, <come> on. <laughs> we should pick on each other, but yeah. <laughs> this isn't meant as picking, picking on you at all. But the, the formulation of the question, for me, beautifully encapsulates what's wrong with how many of us approach this subject. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't be sitting around and asking, asking ourselves whether we think that civil liberties are eroding. The question is, do we have credible measures of those? If so, we can answer that question. If not, then our hunches are really not worth all that much. I'm not saying that there isn't backsliding, but instead of measuring our hunches, our subjective evaluations more and more accurately, why don't we try harder to collect better evidence? Now, obviously that's easy to say, 
It's really hard. But what I take away from, from Andrew and Annie's paper is that that's what we really need to put our energy into. And I don't think, I'm, I'm pretty sure Stafford wouldn't disagree that we need to do everything we can uh, to come up with ever better measures and ever more comprehensive measures. Um, and we can do that for civil liberties. It's, it's very hard, but it's not impossible. So take freedom of the press. We can look at the laws on publishing and censorship in different countries and come up with cross-nationally valid criteria. Uh, of course, laws may not be enforced, uh, so we need to measure how they're enforced. And we need to come up with objective criteria that work cross-nationally for that. Uh, we can look at whether there are at least a few publications that are allowed to publish criticism of the government in different countries. Uh, that would be a start. Uh, the data on imprisonment of journalists may also be part of the measure. I'm not crazy about the data on journalist killings for reasons I won't go into here, but yeah, I'm not sure how much those data uh, really show or whether they really show what uh, people sometimes think. Um, so I think that's the real message that unless we have credible measures of something, we can't confidently say what the answer to the question is. Uh, and that's most definitely not a statement that there isn't backsliding. But I think we need to do the hard work, continue to do the hard work, continue to try harder uh, to get to the point where we can say, even if we don't know in some global comprehensive, uh, you know, final definition of civil liberties and freedom of the press, uh, whether it's gone up or down, at least we have some objective measures, which most people will accept, that give us some indication of the direction of change. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We, we don't need we're to not, clap every not, time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but just for that's, that's 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 just for you. Oh, that's that's fair. Fair. <laughs> hold the applause. Yeah. It's an objective. Yeah. Yeah. Please, <laughs> please hold the applause to the end. Yes. Yana, go ahead. Well, I, I think I can be maybe even shorter because I can build um, on both what Stefan and um, Dan have said. So the answer to the question posed is no. Um, I, I don't agree. Uh, maybe there's maybe we'll have unanimity on that. I'm not sure. Um, so I don't think that elections are effective measures of governance. Um, you can, you know, there's a lot various different ways of uh, looking at that. One of the things that Freedom in the World demonstrates is that over the last 20 years, about 10 countries have dropped out of the uh, electoral democracies category. So just, you know, in terms of that, we can see, and you can say, you know, 10 of 120 is not that many, what's the big deal? Okay, fine. But I want to take a kind of a different tact up to this. So let's say that um, elections continue to be an excellent measure of um, turnover, which is essentially what I think um, Anne and uh, Andrew are, are demonstrating. So let's say that elections perfectly measure um, democracy, if democracy means turnover. Great. What are we missing when we just look at that picture? We're missing things like what just happened in Guatemala, right? We had turnover of government. We have an outsider who is an anti-corruption activist be elected. Guatemala continues to um, perform incredibly poorly on things like freedom of expression, right? They routinely arrest journalists. Uh, one of the major um, publishers or founder and publisher of a major opposition newspaper is in prison. Lots of people have fled the country. Uh, Anti-corruption judges and prosecutors are fleeing, right? So there is turnover. And yet on all these other measures of what we would consider uh, the, the things that make democracy work, Guatemala is not performing well. What about Brazil? We had turnover there last year, right? At an incredible cost. What about the US? So there are all these examples where you continue to have turnover, and yet you have all this degradation in both political rights and in civil liberties. And if we sort of sweep that aside, we're missing a big part of the picture. So that's kind of one part. But the second part that I think we're missing, and I like that both um, both Anne and Andrew talked about kind of you know keeping um, keep our eyes on the on the on the ball and understanding what we're doing. 
So what are we doing when we're trying to measure this? One of the things that Freedom House is trying to do is to remind governments of the commitment that they made to the Universal Declaration on, the, on Human Rights, right? Which is a set, which is a, a commitment to protect a set of rights, not just a commitment to protect democracy, right? So it's a much more expansive approach. And you can say, well, how much do, do these other kind of rights matter for democracy if we're just looking at turnover? And you can have arguments about that, but you can start to lose large parts of the picture. And I think what we have to keep in mind is that um, people live in those countries, right? And it matters to them that they have freedom of expression and freedom of movement and freedom of religion and all of these other, uh, you know, rights essentially. And so actually to answer Dan's question, do we know what's happening to civil liberties? I would say that we do. Freedom in the world demonstrates that certain civil liberties, specifically freedom of expression, rule of law, and uh, measures that are associated with corruption are decreasing. They are deteriorating. And that's been consistent over the last 15 years. I think the interesting question is, can we continue to have, and maybe for how long, turnover while this other degradation is happening? But the reality is that it is happening. And so I think it's good to have the conversation, but it's also good to have the conversation about what we're measuring and why we're measuring it and why what we're measuring may be missing other parts of what makes democracy work. And by virtue of that, frankly, leaving people kind of um, you know, people who are living under these conditions that are deteriorating sort of out of the picture, out of this conversation. So I'll pause there in the interest of five to Thank seven you. minutes. Just, just, interrupt. just briefly, if, you, if those in back want to sit down, there are seats available up front. But if you're happy in back, you're happy in back. But there are some seats available up here. Right. Yeah, um, so I, it's a really interesting question. I, I guess in the spirit of um, questioning premises, um, I'll, I'll question the premise of the question as well. Um, and, and maybe picking up on something that Dan said, you know, I think that if we take Andrew and Anne's argument seriously, then the question of whether civil liberties are declining worldwide, you know, it may very well be unanswerable. Um, I think I'm quite a bit more pessimistic than Anne is. I think, yes, we should search for more objective indicators of civil liberties. I don't think that search is likely to, to bear much fruit. Um, and so I, I think that we might just have to bite the bullet that, well, if we think that civil liberties are important to measure and, and to track, like we're gonna, we're just gonna have to uh, sort of resign ourselves to some somewhat subjective indicators because there just aren't gonna be um, credible, more objective alternatives uh, out there. Um, I mean, for what it's worth, I personally think that expert assessments are extremely valuable and in some cases perhaps more informative um, than than more objective indicators. I think you know Stefan was was pointing out sort of individual cases where the objective indicators really seem to miss important uh, important events. And I, I think that's very true. Um, and what's nice about an expert assessment is they can sort of take you know, the totality of circumstances into consideration and say, you know, yeah, this country doesn't look great. And, and that is subjective. And that is, you know, it is sort of a smell test. And and, and that's not ideal. But I, I nonetheless think it, it's pretty credible. Um, OK, so, so if we take Andrew and Anne seriously, maybe the question is unanswerable. Um, I think that if we take doll seriously or, or other folks who, who have sort of a more maximalist perspective on democracy the question may just be nonsensical um you know so i was sort of looking at um definitions of democracy out there in the backsliding literature huck and ginsburg have this really nice piece on um constitutional retrogression retrogression they basically make the claim that civil liberties and electoral um uh, uh sort of responsiveness these, these things are inherently inextricable you just you just can't sort of study one um, in the absence of the other. They say, you know, one cannot have meaningful political competition without the relatively free ability to organize and offer policy proposals, criticize leaders, and secure freedom from official intimidation. So in that, you know, if, you, if you believe that, which I, I think I kind of do, it just doesn't make sense to ask whether civil liberties are declining while elections are still serving as effective checks on power. If civil liberties are declining, then definitionally uh, elections can't be serving as, uh, as effective checks uh, on power. Um, I guess just a couple other sort of miscellaneous thoughts. Um, you know, and and you you said at the at the top of the talk that um, staying in power is is the end game, right? And I think that's probably true, but it it also seems like it's just an end game. And and one way we might make some progress here is by thinking about what what do backsliders really want? You know, what what is the point of all of these machinations? And and surely one of the one of the purposes is to stay in power, but I think one of the other purposes is to enable uh, sort of you know, dramatic, rapid change uh, 
in the sort of you know institutional and legal landscape uh, and, and and social and economic landscapes with as little friction as possible. And those are things that happen um, between elections, uh, and it might not get picked up by by purely electoral indicators. And maybe it's worth you know studying some of these cases where we would all agree, okay, this is a case of backsliding. Um, and what you know what exactly were these leaders up to? How much of it really came down to just wanting to stay in power, and how much of it was about enabling change with as little uh, as little friction as possible. Um, I have some more thoughts, but I'll, I'll just shut up here. Thanks. Uh, so one of the downsides of going uh, eight or six is that many of the points I'm taking, I'll try to reformulate a couple of them um, uh, slightly differently. Uh, so so I, I think just, just wanting to start before answering the question. Um, so I, I appreciate the discussion on, on objective versus subjective measures, and, and I think we have some fruitful discussions in the, in the symposium on on this distinction. Um, and noted that that's kind of posted more as an academic debate on the, but we should move on from there and try to try to measure objective, uh, uh, collect objective measures. But I, I do think some of these more, uh, let's call them uh, kind of more theoretical academic uh, discussions are really important also if you are to collect the best possible measures. Um, so one concern that we have and that we describe in the paper is that by focusing on uh, let's call it interpolar reliability, that you're prioritizing certain types of, uh, uh, of biases, uh, but you might might open up for others. Um, to take one very simple uh, example, so the, the jailing and killing of, of journalists. Um, you, for example, consider in North Korea, so this is one of the one of Stefan's favorite examples, so <laughs> I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll be helpful there. Um, I mean, there aren't all that many people, uh, journalists, killed in North Korea. <laughs> there simply aren't all that many journalists, right? And per <laughs> uh, civil liberties and media freedom from objectively measuring the number of kills, even if you do that perfectly, uh, you are going to end up with a bias measure. So this is the type of debates that we are having. So I think rather than thinking in terms of objective versus subjective, let's think in terms of how to minimize different types of bias. And I think that will give an even more fruitful discussion on how to how to further improve measures. And that being said, some of the things that are seem to be very objective, like the measures that you are using also have so we're looking into the intercode the reliability of those measures, and it's 70%, 80%. So it's it's not really objective either. Uh, so in a sense, it's it's kind of a false like me. So I'm going to answer the question, uh, and my answer is also no. <laughs> uh, and I won't go uh, in a very, very detailed manner into, into why, but it's, it's exactly this last last part on, uh, uh, that has been discussed now for uh, quite extensively, that having competitive elections requires that you are able to form opposition parties, so you need freedom of association. It requires that you're able to, to speak your mind and criticize the government, so it requires freedom of expression. So even if you have kind of elections are uh, are there and there are multiple parties, you do need to have certain similarities just in order for these to be completed. So it's really hard to then disentangle. And I think this is then one of the, uh, so the question then on, on why not, um, why don't we see this, this dramatic change in turnover and, and, and these indicators that, that um, uh, Andrew and Anna are, are collecting? I think there are several several reasons for that. So I, I tend also to agree that uh, that many of the previous accounts have, have uh, kind of over dramatized the, the extent of the decline. Uh, so, I, but I also think there there has been a decline even in electoral uh, electoral measures such as the the measures of electoral democracy. I think one of the reasons why why you, you are not finding it is that you are uh, as as you presented you are picking certain indicators, so it's not rooted in a um, in a fully specified concept. So you're picking certain indicators. And those are not showing a decline to me. That's like taking a few parts of the concept and, and then drawing an inference about the, uh, how democracy moves. So think, for example, of turnover. So even if you have a system where you have turnover, uh, but then there's a coup uh, two months afterwards, or the Taliban comes in and takes out the government, and you continue to count the latest turnover in the election three or four or five years with, with the objective measures, then you are going to miss a very important part of how any total competition is uh, functioning. Um, and then there are two final short points uh, on, on why I don't think kind of uh, the inferences from from your indicators are authoritative on on the uh, you know, whether or not elections are are declining. And the first one is that we look into our paper and, and see that for those countries that are backsliding, for example, on Eden's polarity index, that predicts missingness on many of your indicators. So there's a systematic missingness. So you're kind of 
taking a prune sample, we're throwing out a lot of the countries that have been backsliding and then taking the average across the remaining countries, uh, which are not, not back, backsliding as much. So I think that's the one, one point. And the other is that the threshold is really, really high on many of the indicators. So for example, for the DPI legislative index, the best, the most democratic score is basically 75%, less than 75% of the elected legislators are from one party. So that can mean that you have a fairly kind of fairly strong electoral authoritarian system with 74.99% of the ruling party. Uh, and a very democratic country would be counted in the top category. So this is also why I um, this is one reason that we discuss in our paper that you don't find us clear backsliding. Uh, so okay, we're going to go to Daniel and then to Mike Miller, who is uh, participating virtually. So go ahead. Yeah, so I agree with like Dan, Robert, Carl, and I can give like all of these points just with a German accent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, like both in the arguments uh, uh, that they were making, and then also that like I read the question and I was like the this connection of of elections or the separating out of like. Basically, free and fair elections and uh, and the civil liberties. Um, uh, I I struggled with this and like this underlying here is like rereading uh, democracy with adjectives or something like this, where you then have like as the root definition of democracy is it's just required to have like civil liberties and free and fair elections. Otherwise, what what are we uh, necessarily talking about? And I also agree that like civ measuring civil liberties is incredibly hard, or probably is really hard. Um, in in our approach, like we took uh, took the argument the argument very serious, and like okay, maybe it is truly the case that there is some like bias that has happened. Um, but what we can do is we can just say like let's fix a date where we say there is bias that is now seeping in into. Uh, into codings, um, into evaluations of experts um, uh, of, of democracy scores, and then see if whether or not data patterns that exist before change. If we like make predictions based on what existed before, but we agree maybe there wasn't like the subjective idea of that like we are going back in, in, in a democracy. Um, we are using this on aggregate democracy scores. I don't think that we would do extremely well on, on civil liberties with this approach, and I wouldn't really know how to go there um, with this one. But I, I agree with this like sentiment that so, so far that it's really, really difficult to separate these things out because they're like, fundamentally necessary. Like we can like talk about Switzerland in 1971 um, as like the, the elections there, but you know, like that's the year they enfranchised women in, in the country. And that's like, you know, what does like election report tell me in like this like, country, oh yeah, that like the damage to back democracy and they, uh, fantastic aspects too, but like part of it is like a reduction of or like a limitation of some liberties in this country for like some one group, and that's like not so best. Um, and we need to connect these things. Um, but we need to... All right, uh, Professor Miller. Hi, how's it going? Um, sorry for the terrible quality. I'm on vacation, so I have to uh, sit out in the balcony to avoid waking up my newborn. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm also a no. Um, and I think the, the big problem here on elections is that uh, when you measure things like turnover and electoral closeness, as they do, um, and take them at face value, it misses uh, how those things are happening, which is a pretty critical uh, thing for, for modern politics. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, a close election, but massive electoral fraud, that's a bad thing for democracy, but would be counted as great on, on this, uh, these objective measures. Um, what I actually find when I look, when I use the same data set, Nelda, that, um, Anne and Andrew do, is that there's actually a pretty dramatic increase, uh, within democracies in the fraction of turnovers that only actually occur because of some, uh, something outside of the ballot box, either some massive uh, electoral protest, including violence, uh, a coup or a threat of a coup or something something else. Um, when you take account of that and don't count those uh, pretty bad outcomes as good for democracy, you now do see a pretty substantial decline in what I call clean electoral turnovers. So if you scrutinize uh, these elections, even in quite objective terms, like just taking account of whether there's you know, a, a coup or a threat of a coup or something like that, um, you do see a very clear decline uh, in electoral quality within democracies. 
Um, now, the reason this is a, such a, a huge problem uh, for what Anne and Andrew are doing is that um, they really don't have a lot of indicators here that track democratic quality within democracies. It's really just these election indicators. Uh, pretty much everything else just doesn't vary uh, at, at all within democracies. Suffrage, multi-partyism, the, the DPI indicators, even the jail journalist thing is 97% zero for democracies. Um, so they really don't have any indicators outside of these election uh, uh, measures. Uh, and when I th- go look at how well the objective index tracks democratic quality within democracies, it's nothing. It doesn't track it at all. It's completely blind to democratic quality variation within democracies. Um, I'm sure there's sort of a series of things which I can, I'm happy to elaborate on. It'll be in, it'll be in the response, but I don't want to go on too long. Uh, but I just find there's like a total failure to track democratic quality of democracies. So what the index and all these indicators are doing is picking up some forms of variation in democracy, particularly like democracy versus autocracy, uh, closed autocracies versus liberalized autocracies, but they're totally blind to variation in democratic quality within democracies. And the reason that's such a problem is that from the very beginning, this whole narrative of democratic backsliding has principally been based on what's happening inside the world's democracies. Virtually all of the cases people bring up to illustrate democratic backsliding are democracies. The United States, Hungary, Poland, Brazil, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you look at the uh, trends in the indices like VDEM, Freedom House, and so on, the overwhelming fraction of decline is occurring within democracies. So autocracies are basically fat. There's no sustained uh, difference within, uh, within autocracies. It's really only occurring within democracies. So because Anna and Andrew are missing variation within democracies, they're missing kind of the whole story of what's occurring with democratic backsliding. Um, and that's not even that's even including the election stuff in their index. So if you take account of a flawed just taking turnover is what its face value is, uh, it gets even worse. So that's kind of my whole response. Um, but no, I see I, uh, to answer the question, I, I do think there's a clear decline in the quality of electoral competition within democracies. But you have to look a little bit deeper at how uh, turnovers and competitions occur. All right, I'm going to let Anne and Andrew uh, weigh in very briefly, and then we should have time for about one-tenth of one more question before we go, <laughs> go to the Q&A. Okay, so, so I actually, so what I'm going to do is, like, I think that these debates are awesome and we need to have it. So instead of responding to debates, all I'm going to do is just clarify a few things, um, because the one thing I don't want to do is make this literature worse by like misinterpretations and stuff like that, right? So I want to clarify a few things. The first really important thing I want to clarify is we're not saying that we think that the evidence definitively shows there's no backsliding. That is not what we're saying. We're saying what Dan is saying and what Andrew wants you to say, which is we don't know. We're saying that we think the evidence is not good enough to make a strong claim about whether there is or not backsliding. The evidence, like if this were a journal article, like it would not pass the robustness checks that like any referees would want to see, right? That's what we're stressing. Um, So I think it's really important to highlight that and clarify what we are seeing and what we're not seeing. So the second thing that I wanted to emphasize is I do really want to make a concerted effort to not have people use our variables in the wrong way. Because once again, I'm not trying to make this debate worse and messier. So actually, the way that Stefan talked about China being a perfect democracy is the exact wrong way to use our data. Please don't do that. Here's the reason why. So we do have missing data. Um, And I can actually tell you exactly why we have missing data. It's very fair to point it out. Um, countries in our sample will have missing data if they have no elections, because so many of our scores are looking at elections, right? So if a country doesn't have elections, um, we're just not going to, we are going to have missing data for that country, right? But at the same time, if our country isn't holding elections, I'm not quite sure why we're talking about democratic backsliding for that country, right? But here's the nice thing about our measures that we're looking at. I can tell you exactly what we're missing and we know exactly what variables we're looking at. We can totally argue about whether that's useful or not, 
right? So for instance, back to the China example, um, missing elections data, because they don't have executive elections. So where the data does show up is with executive constraints, right? And so for a while, China had no executive constraints, and then they adopted executive constraints, and then they got rid of term limits, right? That's what Stefan is referring to with like, at some points, they had like a quote, unquote, perfect score, right? So we can like debate about whether that's useful or not. Once again, I actually, this is part of the reason why I don't think it's super useful to think about autocracies in the same way as democracies, right? But so like you can say, I hate how you're doing this. And I'll be like, that's totally fair. But at least we know what we're talking about. This is exactly the, the data that we're talking about, right? As opposed to if you have like a democracy score with country experts, like they're not in front of me. I can't ask them like how they scored something the way that they did. I'm not like quite sh as sure how certain decisions got made, right? And so I do think that that's one benefit of these objective measures. Although I totally will concede that sometimes the mapping of objective measures to the concept of democracy, might there might be some tensions there. And I think that's something we can totally debate. But I do want to make sure people aren't kind of using the data that, that we look at in the wrong way. Not a democracy score. Please don't use it like that. Great. Um, oh, so maybe I'll, I'll just add two things. Not, I mean, not to sort of um, argue with anyone, but just to say, I think there's like two great directions for research that, that come out of this discussion. Um, so one of them, which I think actually, uh, which the Daniel's paper starts is trying to say, okay, like, you know, we made this crude objective index that has a lot of problems, but is it possible to come up with a democracy score that only relies on objective data? And I think they've made some really great progress on, on showing a path forward to doing that. Um, and, you know, but it's not a fully solved problem. And I think that's sort of a great direction. So, you know, in some sense, the criticism of the, of the objective index, like, are correct, but it's not a criticism of the approach. It's just we're trying to summarize stuff, future work to do a better job of this. And, and I think it can. Um, also, we do find the decline in Hungary and Venezuela. Um, that's not true. Uh, and then the other thing I'll point out is, so I think this is like a great theoretical idea that like, you know, maybe, um, you know, we should think of democracy as multiplicative. If there's not civil liberties, does electoral competition even make sense? I think that's like a really compelling, important theoretical idea. But that just raises this really interesting question of like, why are we not seeing the decline in electoral competition? And we don't have an answer to that question. And, and hopefully someone else is going to answer that. So it'd be great to see where, where that goes. All right, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, so we can tell by the spiritedness of this debate and the length of this debate, considering we got through our first question in an hour and 13 minutes. <laughs> um, what we, Justin and I decided to do is really cut to the chase and get to one of our big question that we really wanna ask. And that big question that we really wanna ask is how do we move forward? Because Anne is, Andy has talked about the importance of thinking about that. So we'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And what we're going to do is we're going to go in the opposite direction, starting with Michael and Daniel, with my due apologies to the middle children, who will still be in the middle. Sorry about that. Um, so what we'd like to hear your thoughts on is to what extent should our conclusions about the causes and effects of governance change, if we accept uh, Little and Meg's argument, that the, quote, common claim that we are in a period of massive global democratic de decline is not clearly supported by empirical evidence. So how should we use measures of democracy differently in scholarly work? And should we be using or constrict, uh, constructing different measures? We'll start with Michael. I'll start with Michael. Yeah, go yes. ahead. OK, there we go. Um, how should we? Uh, we should not change anything we're doing. Um, I don't find Andrew <laughs> Ann's argument compelling. OK, uh, panel over. <laughs> I mean, let's be perfectly honest. Like, I think it's a good debate. I think it's nice that it's triggering like more discussion. But uh, the evidence they present is not compelling enough to doubt the narrative at all. Uh, and I really worry about what Stefan pointed out that and I've seen some people say, yeah, oh, oh actually, maybe democratic plan isn't happening. So maybe let's not put as much resources into studying it. Which is what's going to happen or autocrats or quasi autocrats will then say ah look proof that we're actually it's actually fine um people are just anti-indian or whatever um that's the nightmare uh there's plenty of evidence that democratic decline is happening again in the world's democracies i'll add that the primary evidence from the very beginning is not some scrutiny about a line on vdem or something it's cases it's people looking at actual politics happening in places like hungary venezuela turkey and so on um 
and getting into really clear details and making very uh, detailed, careful arguments about how those uh, countries' uh, democratic politics are declining. That's where this all started um, and where it should, the emphasis should continue. Um, looking at democracy indices is fine, uh, but it's, you know, it's often messy uh, for reasons we're seeing here. Uh, and so I think the way forward is actually to look at actual cases, the cases of people, we all know what these cases are that people are talking about that have formed the the narrative in the first place. And if we're going to claim that this whole thing is overblown, tell us which cases political scientists have wrong, which are the cases that they've been talking about forever and are back generally backed up by things like Freedom and Freedom House that are not actually declining. There's nothing like that in Andrew and Ann's paper. Like, what are the ones that people have been overblown about? There have to be a ton of them if VDM and Freedom House and everyone are, are wrong about all this. We should be able to point to 20 cases where actually, no, it's, it's totally fine. People are just exaggerating the decline. Um, but I haven't heard any case like that. Um, and I don't know of any case where it's like, actually, it turns out it's really fine. So I think continue with a really heavy emphasis on qualitative cases. Um, if people do want to go down this road of improving measures, maybe uh, something more like we actually look directly for evidence of bias rather than just like a different measure and assume that if the, di if the measures are different, then it must be a result of bias, like look for actual evidence of bias. Um, but I think what we're actually doing here with a balance of quantitative and qualitative is, is totally fine. And the narrative is is almost certainly correct. Daniel, you want to go ahead? Yes. Uh, and I would like to connect this to something uh, that uh, Andrew said earlier about uh, like what we study and how we study and how we look at democracy. The sample composition, um, for example, like what is being included, what are we examining, whether we should only look at democracies, what are the polities that we are actually including. Our project started as with the starting point was how can we like cheaply build on uh, on, on Vietnam's polyarchy index and extend it to things that have not yet been coded. How can we extend it um, while VDOM is like still working? Um, uh, and like, how can we like cut the corner there basically? No, like, under no circumstances if we ever conceive this as like an alternative index to the point. It's basically like an extension of that. Um, and uh, to that, I think what's also like, at least what, what I've read in the debate uh, is how we measure that and like where we measure the democratic backsliding if you talk about these global measures, these global averages, or whether or not we are talking about like, country specific things, it's also something that we need to talk about. And you might arrive at very different uh, conclusions on like how we aggregate our data, what the, the mechanisms are. Are we like skipping over the question of like population weighted uh, questions that like Safan uh, mentioned earlier as well? I think all of these things play into the role. So like answering the question is really, really difficult because it sort of depends on how I'm mixing all the things together to arrive at my conclusion. And, um if like the takeaway from uh from the panel or the, the special edition is like we need, we need to like very carefully evaluate how we talk about this concept even more carefully than we've done before and like very make very explicit what we're looking at and how we examine it then i think that's um uh um like beneficial in all of that. thank you Daniel. um we really want to make sure because there, there there's so many strong feelings about this and i'm sure there's many many questions in the audience um, so if we could limit our responses to two minutes, so we have time for the Q&A, please. It would be, would be tempting to say that we should do everything. Uh, be, being a part of them, of course, I could uh, retire. <laughs> 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 but I, I do think there's more generally, or also beyond beyond them, I think there's been a lot of progress in, in recent years in, in how to measure democracy. And it is really, really hard. So I think that's something that comes out of this debate. It is inherently very hard to measure, measure democracy. And that, that depreciation, I think, is, is important. Um, I think it's impossible to, to try to measure in democracy any, uh, let's say, any any notion of the concept that is widely used uh, in a manner that only relies on, on objective measures. I, I think that's, that is a full serenity. But I do appreciate the discussion on, on how to think about different forms of biases, how to, how to collect measures that are improvements in different manners. So um, if there's one thing I'd... I think what is really beneficial from, from this symposium um, is the attention to uh, kind of discussion around uh, the prospects of, for example, uh, expert evaluation bias, biases, different biases among experts. And, and stuff on the already men mentioned in Sweidman's piece in, in CPS as well, which I think is a great, uh, uh, one more great, great addition to this literature. So I think if there's something that we can uh, kind of take, take along and, and do even more of is, is to Kind of think about very creatively about different 
types of potential bias. Think very creatively about potential tests in the system. And then one uh, one strong urging for me would be then to, to rather than thinking of biased versus unbiased, is to is to start thinking about the extent of bias. So as as Nils, for example, finds in his piece that there might be some biases, but they're not very very large, and then think in a very sober manner about what that does for our inferences and scores. So I think having these debates in a very academic manner without kind of jumping to the conclusion that, well, if there is a particular bias, we should just take out the baby with the bath water and then collect new measures. I, I think that would be a very, uh, a very bad path to take uh, take a more measurement. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, maybe I'll, I'll start by sort of shamelessly plugging um, our approach and, and <laughs> contribution to this special issue. So we've been working on building a, a, an event data set on democratic erosion, basically tracking the events that might explain movements in you know indices like like VDIM, for example. Um, and we found it to be sort of a, it, it's still this is a beta version of this data set, so don't you know I'll, I'll give you the same. Uh, uh, warning that, that Anne gave you about their index. You know, don't don't go downloading this and thinking that, that this is uh, you know capturing democratic erosion worldwide. Um, but what, what turned out to be useful about sort of looking at the events is it does help you sort of um, adjudicate between uh, you know cases cases where you know so VDEM is showing democracy tanking in some country and and Andrew and Anne's indicators are, are more sort of flatlining. Looking at those events can really help you know, be sort of disentangle like okay what's actually going on on the ground that might justify uh, a tanking score, or, or, or that might not, um, and I think it ties into what what Mike was saying earlier. Um, I, I have you know reached a different conclusion about um, the the evidence that Andrew and Anne present, but I, I do think thinking seriously about these cases and maybe moving from the cases you know to the indicators. Um, so you know, looking at individual cases where we we would all agree, okay, this is a this is a backsliding democracy, right? Just it, at, we give it the smell test, and this is backsliding. And then we can look at, okay, these indicators that Andrew and Ann propose, are, are they picking that up? Um, and if not, you know, what, what else would we need to be measuring? And then we can sort of build out the collection of indicators that we're gonna look at based on cases that, that we sort of all agree um, are backsliding. I think that also gives us a chance to test what I think is a really interesting empirical claim that, that Andrew and Ann make, which is that even if democracies are eroding in these sort of subtler ways, maybe ways that have more to do with civil liberties, we probably ought to be picking those up. In, in these electoral measures. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I think yeah. quite, quite possibly it is. It's an empirical question. Um, and I think looking at these cases might help you start to answer whether that, whether that really is true, right? Like if, if you just look at those electoral measures, are you picking up other things that are going on or do you need to have you know, a different set of measures altogether? I would say, I mean, maybe to reinterpret, which I know people always love when you reinterpret the question being asked, but um, maybe to reinterpret, how can we be doing this work better? So I guess from uh, the perspective of civil society, we would love to have your help to do this better because the, the reality is that we're facing a lot of pressures, right? So we get criticized by academia, we get criticized by members of the EU for not being hard enough on countries like Hungary and Poland. Why haven't we called them autocrats already, right? Then we get criticized by the likes of Orban, or we get criticized by the Indian government for being too hard on them. And then we present this work to the National Endowment for Democracy, who asks us, well, but apparently there is no backsliding, so why should we even give more money to support democracy initiatives around the world, right? So um, have a little bit of pity on us. Um, <laughs> but, but, but also, I think that People in this room are normatively committed to democracy, right? We all want to see more democracy. We want to see more freedom. We want to see more respect for human rights. So I would ask scholars in this particular issue area to help us do this work better because we're going to continue to make this index. And if there are parts of this index that don't make sense to you, then we would really love to hear how we can improve that within the confines of the work that we do. Also knowing that we're a nonprofit and, and, and also, I mean, Frankly, we have rating review meetings where we sit with academics who tell us we're not being hard, you know, hard enough on countries or we're being, you know, too lenient or what about this arrest, what about that? And we actually have to like, you know, reel people back in and say, okay, we can't zero out everyone's scores just because you don't like what happened this year. So we can definitely do this work better. I wish it wasn't so siloed. I wish that, um, you know, more of it happened. It's great that the symposium is happening. It would be also great to harness the kind of brain power in this room to help us do what we do um, better and, and, and I guess in a more sophisticated way. 
Thank you. I want to say, first of all, that I really respect VDEM. Uh, I use it in my own work, and I want to make that absolutely clear to the 18 members of the VDEM team who are surrounded. <laughs> See you out back after the <laughs> But and, well, <laughs> you're outnumbered there. <laughs> Actually, uh, I think if you read VDEM's reports, you would, like me, come to the conclusion that they actually agree with me that we cannot confidently say that there's been backsliding. Why do I say that? Because one of the strengths of VDEM is that it provides confidence bounds. It provides measures of statistical significance. And if you look at the graphs for electoral democracy and liberal democracy over time, Stefan will correct me if, they, if, if I'm wrong about this, but I believe that the extent of the decline uh, is not statistically significant in either case. Now, on this general question of subjective versus objective, I'm really quite surprised to hear so much resistance to trying to make things more objective. Uh, it's too hard, it's a fool's errand. Uh, don't just say we're biased, prove we're biased if you want to reject our subjective measures. I think that science has progressed by going from the expression of subjective beliefs to articulating reasons to believe something to formalizing methods to measure concepts and test claims in a reproducible way. It's been a path from more subjective to more objective. And, you know, on subjective measures, I've, I've been through, I, I started out my career writing about corruption measures, expert judgments about expert uh, evaluations of corruption. So I did that before I got to democracy. I think the question you need to ask is what does the expert coder or, or me or staff and do when we sit down and we try to answer the question, what was the level of freedom of association say in Argentina in 1923? What do we do? Well, in the worst case, we just see what comes to mind. We, we, we stick in the question, we, an answer comes out, not very reliable. What's the next best thing that we could do? Well, we go and we review some books we've read. We think about cases a little bit better. Uh, what would be even better than that? We do a study. We collect data. <laughs> we'll do. Very, very close. We collect data. We run a regression. And then we publish the results of that. Or we use that to confirm. What I'm saying is uh, science means making it more objective. There's no reason why I should believe somebody or accept their answer unless I understand the process that produced it. And I think it's reasonable if, to, to ask if it's possible to do scientific work, then we should do the scientific work. We should publish the data, we should publish the regressions and make our judgments based on that. If it's not possible to do that, then why, why should we view the answer that an expert gives as worth taking seriously? Thank you. Thank you. Um, two minutes. Uh, Dan, uh, yes, depending on the time frame. Yes, depending on uh, also if it's uh, weighted by population or only weighted by a government. Uh, but we can go into that. I want to, I think, when we talk about this, and I'm all for getting better uh, measures and better methods to get at important questions and, and be able to describe the world the way it is. Now, um, and I've, I've said for a long time, I mean, if, if we think VDEM is best in many ways, if, but if nothing better comes in 20 years or so, uh, we as a field have, have failed because we, we need to evolve and then we need to do better. Um, but what we should not forget is what Satori pointed out in 1968, that there is concept measurement validity, right? If we're not measuring what we want to measure, then uh, we are also failing and we're also introducing bias. And on this notion, 
I, I mean, I reject this use of objective subjective here. I don't think we are, when we use country expert, uh, measuring subjective, whatever feeling comes into mind and all that, right? We have a, a methodology for that. For And, and I think, you know, there's also a, a, an aspect of this that makes me a bit uncomfortable with some of the remarks. We have 4,000, over 4,000 country experts, academics mainly, um, from over 180 countries. And then a lot of sort of vignettes and blah, 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 anchoring, uh, advanced measurement model to get uh, com reliable comparisons and so on and so forth. Now, this notion that only if you're in an American university with your RAs on the uh, specific indicators you can find uh, knowledge, whereas these uh, 4,000 country experts who really know what's going on in those countries much better than we do, and that their knowledge, that we're tapping into their knowledge, their qualitative knowledge, Mike Miller talked about that, to quantify that, and that that, for some reason, is not valuable. I think that's a dangerous proposition uh, that I that I want to turn around. And that's, I think, is the end of my two minutes. I can see you getting nervous. But uh, okay. uh, well, let me... Just one second. Just one second. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. We yield to the audience. Yeah. All right, Are so... You, sure? you don't want to respond then? No, no, it's fine. No, no, we're that, fine. Thank you. We're thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what I want to thank ask you now then is, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and start uh, lining up at the podium if you are... Uh, in the audience, and uh, once we recognize you, just ask your question into the microphone so that everyone, including the people uh, on Zoom, can hear you. Uh, if you have a question and you're in the Zoom audience, you can either use the little Q&A box and we'll see it there. Uh, you can also, I believe, raise your hand and we, we, can, uh, we can recognize you in that way. So at this point, I will open the floor to questions. And, and we ask that the questions be a question <laughs> and that they be relatively brief. Please, thank you. We have one could, could you come to the here. front? Yeah, at the podium and the microphone. No, 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 I'm sorry, that the other stand, that microphone right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I just thinking about, you know, a lot of this debate and the VDEM model. Um, and what came to mind is, you know, the measurement models that um, uh, VDEM uses, I've used, um, are kind of based on some kind of averaging process, right? And make no causal assumptions about the way that the indicators are related to each other or necessarily to democracy, which is usually a strength because you want to separate measurement from inference. But I'm wondering if we should think about fitting structural models where we do make assumptions about these things that maybe civil liberties, you know, cause things about party systems or the you know, number of journalists who are killed in a given year. And fitting structural models might help us to test some of these theoretical differences. I don't know if we've ever done that. Structural models are kind of their own pitfall, but it's just an idea. And I don't know if the VDM team has ever thought about those types of things. Michael, do you want to you wanna answer that question? I can answer. Um, well, I guess in the first place, yeah, I, I've done a lot of thought about that. And uh, in the first place, um, part of our aggregation technique when we take a bunch of indicators and turn it into an index, uh, usually an important part of that process for some of the indicators is to do a Bayesian factor analysis, which is a kind of structural equation model. Uh, it's, it's treating all of the indicators as reflective indicators of the um, latent concept that we're trying to measure. And so there are arrows pointing there. Um, I've also taken a look at uh, mimic models in which some of the indicators are formative indicators and some of them are reflective indicators. Um, so far, I haven't been able to demonstrate that it makes any difference at all. But uh, that's something I'm still interested in and eventually may make more of. So anyway, we've, we've thought about it, but we haven't had, found a practical use for it beyond just doing factor analysis. Any other questions? Please step forward. 
Yeah, thank you so much for a really, I mean, a really fascinating and, uh, and, and lively debate. I'm wondering, so I think throughout this panel discussion, we've heard kind of somewhat uh, sideswiped ethical accusations towards, uh, towards each other. Uh, on the one hand, perhaps if we say there's no democratic backsliding, we're giving kind of comfort to would-be autocrats. And on the other hand, if we are not using more purely objective measures, then we are kind of uh, you know, doing in an injustice to the discipline of political science and people aren't going to take it seriously. Um, and I'd love to hear kind of the members of the panel kind of take those ethical concerns a little bit more directly uh, rather than them being kind of asides in this discussion. Um, so yes, we'd love to hear kind of a little bit more about what are the ethical responsibilities when it comes to this debate on democratic backsliding. Do you guys want to start? I feel like this is an Andrew Little. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I, I am certainly for all for uh, centering these questions more. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I sort of like said 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 my piece on this. Um, I, I think I just want to highlight that you know it's it's like it's a ch it's a challenge no matter what you know. So like someone in India may read our paper and say something that has nothing to do with it. It's not our paper, and you know it's it's hard to know what our responsibility for that. Similar, you know, someone could take the other data and make uh, crazy claims and 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 you know, I wouldn't want to hold other authors responsibility if someone misreads their paper uh and, and says something uh inaccurate. But you know, I mean I, I mean I think um I think the you know the best we can do is is just is just always be honest with ourselves and be 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 um as as clear about what we can and can't infer from the data. Um, and, and, you know, to the extent possible, correct misperceptions out there and, and just be as responsible as we can, uh, when we're, when we're outward facing, but I'm sure other people probably have. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, and I, I think part of that responsibility also lies then in what I just mentioned in the last comment, the, the concept measurement validity, right? And if we go out and make claims uh, uh, with regards to democratic backsliding and say there is or there is not, we better make sure that we are make, measuring democracy and backsliding um, in, a, 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 in a in a indefensible way, uh, fully. Um, also in the full sense of the concept. And we've discussed here with the sort of civil liberties, but it's also freedom. I mean, the freedom of association with civil liberty, civil society and, and, and freedom of speech, um, freedom of the media. Um, so, so I, I think we need to take that, that, um, that question seriously. Yeah. yeah. Just a couple quick thoughts. I mean, I, I think first, I don't think we can, possibly evaluate the credibility of the sorts of empirical claims that Andrew and Anne are making on the basis of like what the National Endowment for Democracy will do if they read the claims or what the Indian government like that's just not oh, fun, oh, fundamentally not in the oh. spirit of an empirical exercise I don't I don't think that's what no, anybody's that's arguing, what but I, I think we should put that up like it is about making empirical claims and I think Andrew you, you're you know what you said is right you know we just have to be careful about the way we make them and ultimately it's hard to really control the way um they they might be used I do think I mean when you sort of detect the intensity of uh, emotion around this debate. I, I treat that as almost sort of prima facie evidence in, in favor of your guys' argument, but like, <laughs> wow, we really care about this. And like, if we care about it this much, it, some of that might creep into the way um, that we're making supposedly sort of purely, you know, hard-headed empirical judgments about the quality of democracy, so. Uh, Carl, and then, yeah. No, so, so on the, on the, you know, the side, I'm, I'm also, I mean, we should be very real how things can be used and uh, and interpreted. I mean, but there there are limits to how far we should go if you still want to conduct the science. But I think one one thing that uh, so we're often good in political science at, at discussing being very stringent in in certain parts of the of the research process. But I think it slips in others. So so in in you know, in communication of you know, the significance of the findings in introductions and conclusions and so on. That's perhaps one area where we all could be a bit better in thinking of. And also when we sell our <laughs> results uh, to a broader audience, so so pretty stringent in in following tests, but we can be a bit sloppy in in, in terms of generalizing from our results. So I, I think that's perhaps one area where we could think more about this responsibility. And then on the science question, I would also be uh, also, also reacting a bit to dance <laughs> formulations of of subjective, objective, and the indication that there are 
you know, I, I think we should be very much more comprehensive in terms of evaluating different types of bias and measurement error. Uh, so I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't try as hard as possible to, to weed out kind of different types of emotional responses that you're uh, pointing to. Uh, but what I would rather see is, is um, instead of being fixated on one particular area and equating, or one particular type of measure and equating that with, sci uh, with science and scientific uh, rigor, I think we should rather think more comprehensively about minimizing different types of error. And, and there, I just don't think we can uh, uh, do without expert measurements, even if it has its words and all, but, but they minimize other types of error. Uh, so, it's, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think we have to be realistic about the world we live in and maybe it doesn't, you know, it, it's not that reactions to the work should drive how we do the work, but we live in an era where accusations of bias are really, really loaded. We know there's a death of expertise. We, you know, we see this with things like the pandemic and the fact that actual scientific findings are really hard to explain to a lot of people and they're going to read whatever the first sentence is and they're not going to read whatever the second sentence is and that's the reality and if we choose to make our work public which is what's happening here which is what happens on twitter which is what happens in publications or giving journalists interviews then we have to be i think clear about our own findings and about the uncertainty especially when those findings challenge other research and other research findings the limitations of the uncertainty around that challenge so I think we can't, you know, we can do the work without thinking about or being afraid of what the reaction will be. And we, in fact, should do the work without being afraid of what uh, Modi or Trump or anyone else says about the findings. But I think it's a little bit naive to say, well, it doesn't matter what anyone says because it does affect um, lots of other things. Kind of there's a knock on effect from people hearing about these findings and hearing that these debates are happening. Right. Dan. Just to respond to, to uh, Eric, um, the problem for me is that we don't know what the error is with subjective measures usually. I mean, there's two ways that one can think about error. Uh, and one is you compare the measure to the true value, and then you can simply measure the error in the measure. Another is you consider the process that led to the production of that measure and evaluate that process. Um, in the case of subjective evaluations, it's a black box, right? And all I'm saying is, yes, we shouldn't, we shouldn't throw away all that country knowledge of the specialists. We should just try to formalize the way it's incorporated into our measures. We should make that more transparent and uh, systematic. And I think we can do that better, but it's not that I think we should necessarily, I mean, the reason for, for my discomfort with the expert evaluations is in part because we don't know if including them is reducing error or not, because we don't know what the real error is. I guess not really anything to add now, uh, but uh, that's... I'll abuse my moderator privilege to say there's often a similar discussion about medical research. How dare you deny someone the potentially life-saving treatment by putting them in the control arm? But uh, the problem is we don't know whether the treatment works. And so we kind of have to do it. That's the only way we figure out whether something good or bad is happening. And it's not quite the same here because we're not administering drugs, but it is the same in the sense that, you know, people are going to you know, in while this is being worked out, they may take claims just as they take medical claims out of context, right? Oh, they're trying ivermectin, right? We should just start taking ivermectin and see what happens. Um, it later turned out that it had nothing to do with anything, right? It didn't do anything. It made, made some slightly worse. Uh, but the fact that those trials happened and were publicized did cause a lot of people to start putting a lot of faith in it and it didn't work at all. Um, so one thing, I mean, I agree with all this. I mean, what, one thing which surprises me a bit is there's like seems to be a view uh, in a lot of this discussion about the public facing part that that in some sense, um, like the concern is that if we aren't worried enough about democratic backsliding, then bad things will happen. Well, OK, so so imagine I'm a leader who wants to try and attack uh, and, and backslide. What, what do you think is one of the key factors which is going to matter? To me? Do I think it's going to succeed? Do I think that democracy is weak and that, and that I'm going to be able to take over and insulate myself in power if I want? So, so the idea that like 
that that you know the responsible thing to do is to err on the side of painting a picture that that the world that the democracies are collapsing left and right i think is i think is exactly false and that if if in fact a lot of these efforts of resilience are succeeding which is another like great thing to study more um like that's the finding we should be publicizing <laughs> that you know like trump failed bolsonaro failed and and you know that that's maybe there are just two cases, but that may say something about the resilience of democracy. And if leaders think their attempts are going to succeed more than they are, that's actually bad for the world. Oh, yeah. uh, Mike, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, um, I had a couple points. So I, I don't blame Anna and Andrew for whatever however people would misuse this. I don't think they have an ethical <laughs> response. They should print what they think is true. To say that. Um, nor do I think we should err on the side of alarmism at all. Um, I would just say that I, I think just based on a, a fairly impassioned view of the evidence that the evidence is clearly in favor of democratic decline occurring, particularly in the world's democracies. Um, and we should not sort of take, say, well, there's a lot of subjectivity going on or we're not 100 percent. So let's just say, I don't know. I think we should for now stick with there's substantial evidence for democratic decline. And if, if we want to make any kind of move back towards, I don't know, or uh, or whatever, we need a lot more evidence, um, principally case-based evidence. Um, we, we need people, and either Anna and Andrew or people like them, to give us a dozen cases, 20 cases, where people have said there's democratic decline, usually backed up by VDM evidence, but they're wrong. Give us give us that case-based evidence that people have been alarm, alarmist about these specific cases. I don't even know what those are supposed to be. Um, I haven't heard like that much revisionism of like particular cases. Um, it's not an answer responsibly responsibility specifically, I guess, but uh, uh, like I, I need to hear more of those because that's again where, where all of this, the, the principal evidence of this started. Um, so so I, I just think people should carefully weigh uh, based maybe on when they see the responses to this, uh, where they think that the strength of evidence is, continue to improve our as much as we can. Uh, but I, I just, again, just don't think the the contrary evidence is there yet to make any kind of uh, retrenchment. So, like, Mike, you're my good friend. I really respect you. But I'm just, I, I'm not really, I don't really understand why you're saying this, right? Because if you submit an article, if you submit your paper to a journal, and you're like, my results are not significant, but I'm going to claim that there is a really strong effect that would just, that would get like desk rejected, right? Like it just doesn't make any sense to me why we're treating this topic any differently. Um, and then to your other point about, um, you know, like where is all of this, um, you know, like what, what are all these cases that are wrong? Actually, like I agree with you, like in all of the graphs that we showed, all of the lines are actually like very close together, right? Like the trends are actually in general agreement. Um, and so I, I just, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure where you're like, why you're making these claims like this. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, so to be specific about this, if like every country in the world has a 3% bias that's changed over the past 10 years, that completely explains these results. Like no one needs to be getting any individual case wrong to observe the the uh, the, the patterns that we're seeing. Not to say that we shouldn't be studying cases, that's very important, but it's not like there's some magical number of miscoded cases that we're looking for. We think there's probably just a small bias in, in most of them, and, and that, that's sufficient to produce the patterns that we're observing. Mike, did you want to did you want to say something? Yeah, I don't, I don't get I don't get these responses. So uh, I don't know what we mean by it's not significant. Like you can find significant shifts on VDEM, Freedom House. Um, I have it in my response. Um, so th there's definitely significant declines, um, particularly if you look at within democracracies. Um, and I don't three percent by. So I'm referring to like there's a huge amount of case literature like arguing for democratic decline, right? This this came, this came, was where the whole literature came out of. It wasn't like people looked at a line in VDEM and suddenly came up with this. It was people looking at Hungary, people looking at the United States, people looking at Poland, Turkey, Venezuela, you can go on and on and on. So there's a huge set of cases that this 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 narrative you're responding to is based on. If, if you're right and there's no average decline occurring, people have to be wrong about a ton of cases. They have to be exaggerating and that's just empirically that false. <laughs> that's false, Mike. They could be three percent wrong in all the cases, and that would produce the pattern. Yeah. So what's the three percent? I mean, I don't know. Like, what's the three percent in every country? It could be three percent uh, in every country. No, no, no. That's okay. not. That's not true. I mean, we uh, if what? we're talking about thirty-two cases or forty-two that are right now of the past ten years have been declining on democracy, and 
there are cases, I mean, if you take India on the on the liberal democracy index, going from whatever it was, point eight down to like point, uh, what is it now, 46 or something like that, right? That's a lot more than 3%. Uh, Turkey, I mean, uh, you look at the lines going down and, and it's, uh, it's the same. Poland, Hungary, we can... Uh, I can list uh, the, uh, all these countries where there are really, really big shifts in, 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 and declines in democracy over the past well, 10 years. So you have to buy maybe beer afterwards, Stefan. <laughs> 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 no, uh, so, yeah, we, uh, we'll take one more response to this, and then, yes, we can take at least one more question from the floor. Go ahead. It's just directly to, to the discussion that's been going on and uh, what way it's seen as evidence. And, and also, so I agree, it's logically possible that kind of a 3% decline in, in all countries could, I haven't looked exactly at the numbers, but let's say that. And, and this is something that we do in our paper, because I don't think we should stop there by saying that this is a possibility. So we should try to be creative about uh, thinking about tests, and this is something that we do in our response phase. Uh, okay. So what if you are right? <laughs> yeah. What kind of patterns would we observe across countries, across measures? And, and we do not find these types of patterns. So there are some particular countries. So we're even looking into, uh, as, as Mike is uh, asking for, which countries are diverging in, on, on uh, your measures and our measures. And, and as, uh, for example, Stafa noted, Venezuela, for example, uh, backslides a lot more on, on uh, polyarchy than on your measures. So that contributes to a lot of the difference. Denmark is democratizing on your measure, but not, not on ours. That is contributing in the other direction. So, so you can do more than just saying that it's potentially 3%. You can look into the cases. And then I think the case for, for your story is, is weaker than, uh, uh, than, than the more pure theoretical story. So we're testing a lot of implications. Of the question. Yeah, so can we take the question from the floor and then we probably have to wrap up. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm going to align with Development I have, um, I'm confused after this actually. Um, <laughs> and I didn't read your paper thoroughly, but you stood here saying, don't take this as a measure of democracy. And then you said, we don't find democratic backsliding. And of course, if it's not a measure of democracy, of, of democracy you don't find backsliding. This is just a comment, and that's what I'm confused about. I have a question for the Freedom House, Vegan folks, and for you. Because I think since our research is also about saying what 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 are the flaws and the limits of our research, and I didn't hear that. I heard I heard a lot what the flaws of the others are, and I would be really interested. Uh, what do you think should be improved in your paper, and what what are the limits of your paper, and maybe also the others? So, what is really the thing we should improve here to to go forward? And then a last observation: being an outsider. It's really interesting. After 20 years in this, I thought we we're at another stage. But this is a conversation between U U.S. American. I mean, there are two North European outliers here, but between U.S. American political scientists in a field where we talk about global issues. And I really think this is this is a bit disappointing. Thanks. Yeah, so it's easy to just clarify the first question, right? So we are looking at things like turnover, which is a good indicator to evaluate whether democracy has backslid over time. It's not the only one, but it's one. But would I like use turnover as a democracy score? No, because if there was turnover score of dummy equals one, uh, that's not perfect democracy. If there was no turnover equals zero, that's not perfect autocracy. But if the rate of ones and zeros changes over time or not, that tells me something about democracy. So that's an example of a variable that helps us answer the empirical question we were interested in, but I would not just use that as a democracy score. We have lots of flaws. Everyone, everyone got to talk about the flaws in our Yeah, paper, I know. So there's a lot of them. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I, and then yeah. this is a partial answer to that question, and, and sort of partially an answer to a question that um, that Peter and Justin posed a long time ago. Um, it seems to me that one useful thing to do in, in sort of sussing out these flaws is to try to really understand, and maybe it was sort of the, the point that Dan made. How, how are coders like? What are they doing? when they're trying to assess the quality of democracy in any given country. I served as a Freedom House country expert for a number of years for, for some West African countries, also as a, a VDEM, a country expert. So I've, I've like been on the coder side of this. And like my, my impression of my own experience was that the bias was very strongly in favor of 
sort of reproducing what the prior year's score was. And I actually remember going to like Freedom House meetings and being explicitly told like, look, if you want to change the score, you have to have really solid, like credible, uh, you know, objective indicators that, that this score change is, is warranted. But I have no idea if my experience was sort of the, you know, the common experience among, among Freedom House country experts or, or VDM country experts. And sort of digging into that, I think would be a very useful exercise. I think I know someone who does know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, I don't think I need to illustrate what Freedom House's flaws or, um, you know, shortcomings are. They've been pretty plain. I think every 10 years or so, there's a giant critique of what we do. That's fine. Um, it's a 50 year old data set, right? We can't change a lot of the methodology because we would then destroy the time series. So that's one constraint that we have. Um, another constraint is money. It's an NGO. We don't have that much money. We need to cover the entire world every year, which is exhausting. Um, I will say just on terms of it, you know, if we're finding an effect or not finding an effect, the Freedom House scores are sort of designed to be conservative. We are encouraging people to be extremely conservative in their evaluation, which means that for most countries, for between 50 and 60% of countries we evaluate every year, there is no change, which kind of the suggestion that there is a negative bias throughout because of news events or other things, it just, it makes me think kind of critically about that because 50 or 60% of the countries are just not changing year to year. We're not, we're not improving the scores, we're not declining the scores, right? So if there is a bias and it's in one direction, it should be affecting the entire world and not some pockets of the world. Um, there's lots of flaws. Again, I think it's a constructive exercise. Um, I don't think uh, I'll defend it saying that I'm not American. Uh, most of our coders come from around the world. They're not all Americans. So this isn't just the US telling the rest of the world what to do and how to be kind of exercise, but there's always room for improvement. And I and I really hope that one of the kind of things that we get out of this discussion is that um, academics will help us improve these scores and talk to us. If you want to know something about how Freedom House is doing these assessments, I welcome people to send us an email, I promise. We had, uh, we had Anne and Andrew come and give a talk um, after the paper was written, not before, but still, we, we welcome discussions with academics. So please do reach out. Thank you, Yana. So just to wrap, we really need to wrap up right now, but to before we wrap up, I wanted to just make a few points. I wanted to, first of all, thank our participants, not just for the wonderful contributions that they've made to the special issue that you'll see shortly, but also the contributions to the debate today that were wonderful. So I think we... The other thing that I need to do is um, I just need to put a little plug in for the journal. Please don't get up and leave when you hear that. <laughs> um, Justin and I and our two other co-editors, Lena Ben Abdullah and Bettina Wilkinson, have recently assumed the editorship of PS Political Science and Politics and have made a lot of changes to what we're doing. This is a reflection of that. We're seeking out these debates. So pre, this is going to, our journal is now going to be the debate of record on democratic <laughs> backsliding. So please bring these debates to us in the form of special issues proposals for symposia. We would love to do that. Also, um, I just want to make a little state, I want to make a little comment about the American focus of PS. If you read our editorial statement in terms of how we changed our editorial board, of how we have opened our entire ed editorial board to the world and to the global south and how our, our focus on moving away from american politics which um, which is a lot which as a latin americanist i should say u.s politics moving away from u.s politics um you'd see that we are really reaching out to inter international scholars underrepresented scholars scholars that did not traditionally publish in ps so please encourage please submit ideas for articles proposals symposia to us and take a look at our edit our, our statement as a new editorial board if you have the time so thank you to justin for his technical expertise in organizing everything today and uh thanks for all of you for participating in this very very lively debate that will continue <laughs> no we're done